Velkommen til Films TV. På torsdag er der premiere på den australske gangsterfilm Animal Kingdom. David Michaud's debutfilm vandt sidste år prisen for bedste udenlandske film på Sundance Filmfestivalen. Og Jack Weaver blev for nylig Oscar nomineret for sin præstation som en moderne Lady Macbeth, hvis tre sønner regerer den kriminelle underverden i Melbourne, Australien. Filmen er kraftigt inspireret af virkelige hændelser. I 1980'erne udbrød der åben krig mellem Melbournes politistyrker og byens største gangsterfamilie. Og det samme gør der også i Animal Kingdom, hvor familiens yngste medlem Joshua lander midt i skyttegraven mellem de to armeer. Things survive because they're strong. You may think that you're one of the strong creatures. But you're not. You're one of the weak ones. You've survived because you've been protected by the strong. But they're not strong anymore. Hope you find the killers. Which Joe? I'm Detective Senior Sergeant Leggy. This has got nothing to do with me. Everything has got to do with everyone. Now you're not in any danger. What do you think we should do? What's wrong, huh? What's the matter? You've done some bad things, sweetie. Det er en helt igennem fantastisk film, og vi fik talt med David Michaud over telefonen om hans prisbelønnede perle. When I first started writing, I really didn't know what I was doing, and I taught myself to write over those years. So I started again from scratch. I think about four or five times because I just knew that my writing had improved so much that there was no point in me just playing around with what I had already written. I should just throw the whole thing out and start again. Mm -hmm. And there was something exciting about feeling that happening you know and it was you know I was, I was over the course of those eight years writing other things I was writing movies for other people I was you know writing shorts for other people and making my own shorts and and while that was happening I could just feel my writing improving and knew right through that process that I would want to return to Animal Kingdom because I felt that there was a powerful story in there somewhere hey buddy hey Light's green, you idiot. You got a steering problem, mate. What the fuck are you looking at? Fuck. I was particularly fascinated with with uh, a period in Melbourne's criminal history, which was, you know, the 80s and early 90s. Um, and whilst I haven't set the film in the 80s, there was something about that period that felt quite unusual and quite um, dangerous. Uh, it was the last days of armed robbery. It was the last days of these hardened gangs of armed robbers, these old school criminals. And it was the last days of these old school cops as well. These, you know, these quite hardened armed robbery squad detectives who were... Um, quite dangerous themselves you know and that particular period culminated in this one one event uh in 1988 which was the the kind of random and brutal revenge killing of two young cops by a particular gang of armed robbers mm. um and that event which kind of found its way into the center of animal kingdom i found so chilling when I first read about it that I I almost immediately started imagining what would be a kind of big Melbourne crime story that I would build around it. Now, personally, I, I've always felt that Hollywood has romanticized the life of the average gangster. Now, what, one of the things that I really loved about Animal Kingdom was that it was so refreshingly real and so uh, unvarnished in its depiction of organized crime. Uh, what's your take on, on the genre? You know, it was a de you know, deliberate choice for me to make a film that didn't glamorize criminality. And this, you know, and this is like an answer to your previous question too. You know, one of the reasons why I wanted to fictionalize this story was that Australia, but Melbourne especially in the last, you know, few years, has had kind of a disturbing trend in terms of turning real criminal figures into celebrities. Mm. Um, And I didn't want to participate in that process. 
Mm. But it is an absolutely amazing cast. And, and I like how Weaver in an interview described the set as testosterone city. I mean, and there must have been a lot of energy on set with so many great sort of alpha male actors on set, right? Oh, yeah. The energy was pretty intense. And on occasion, a little bit nerve-wracking, you know, because these these boys especially have big personalities. And occasionally, they rubbed each other the wrong way. And, you know, for me as the director, I found myself regularly wondering whether or not I needed to step in and start taking control of them and, you know, playing the father figure, even though a number of them are actually older than I am. Mm -hmm. Um But more often than not, I found myself uh, watching them and smiling and feeling like I had cast the movie right, you know? That the tension that they were bringing to set uh, was feeding into the scenes in a really beautiful way. Mm. Um, and so long as it didn't get out of control and so long as it didn't grind the whole um, production to a halt, it felt like it could only be good. Mm. How, how did you find working with Guy Pearce? Oh, it was wonderful. You know, I feel really quite lucky that, you know, the quote-unquote movie star in the movie was such a wonderful person to work with, you know, that he is first and foremost, uh, a, you know, a, a, very, a, a wonderfully gifted actor. Mm. But he's, he's also incredibly uh, considered and hard-working and, and was incredibly supportive of me, you know. I mean, I think in many ways the fact that he was doing the movie at all was uh, a great confidence booster for me and a, and a great sign of his energy and his beautiful willingness to trust uh, young filmmakers. Because, you know, someone of his, you know, someone of his caliber and stature doesn't need to do movies with... with uh, with young directors. He could he can almost do whatever he wants, you know, but the fact that he believed in this film so much and uh, and said yes to it very quickly, very early on and very enthusiastically mm. made me feel good about the film before we'd even started shooting. And um, and uh, and I I loved working with him. I mean, he's, you know, he's a great actor and he's a, um, a wonderful human being. Now, after watching the movie, I, I just I, I wanted to read up on on, on uh, other reviewers' opinion of Animal Kingdom, and of course, uh, everybody's very positive. But there was one other thing that really shone through in most of them. There was a common thread in that they point out that Animal Kingdom is kind of a shining beacon of light in the Australian film industry. Now, as someone who's worked there for years, how healthy would you say that the Australian film industry is these days? I mean, I, I don't think that it's any healthier or more unhealthy than any film industry anywhere in the world, you know. Films are incredibly difficult things to make. No one knows what they're doing. No one knows if they're getting it right. And it's one of those few art forms where you don't know what it is that you've made until it's too late to change it. You mm. know? Um, and in Australia, you know, we, we only make about, say, I don't know, 50 films a year. Mm. Um, I, you know, I think statistically, for any filmmaking culture, you can't expect that more than, you know, a couple of those are going to work. But I think that, uh, you know, what has been so exciting this year for me is seeing where an Australian film can go when the elements fall into place, you know? Mm. I mean, it's so exciting that Jackie Weaver has been nominated for an Oscar because that just doesn't happen to Australian movies. No, that's great. Uh, Australian, Australian actors get nominated for Oscars all the time, mm. but never for their performances in Australian films. It's always for their performances in American films. Mm. And the last last time, and the only other time, that an Australian actor has been nominated for their performance in an Australian film was... Uh, was Jeffrey Rush for Shine yeah. back in the mid '90s? So it's the fact that Animal Kingdom has managed to travel all this way and land at the Oscars is is uh, is really exciting and really unusual. And I think in some way that's what people might be referring to when uh, when they talk about the shining light. You know, it's 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 that when the element when the, when when the elements fall into place. Uh, an Australian film can actually travel a lot further than we're used to them traveling. Yeah. 
F following the reception at Sundance and all these rave reviews, have you got a sense that Animal Kingdom has opened up some larger doors for you in the business? And do you intend to walk through them? Uh, yes, I do. And you just used exactly the kind of phrasing that I was using talking to someone else a little while ago. Because literally it was exactly that. It just feels like these doors have opened and on some level it would be foolish for me not to walk through them. You know? mm. I mean, I would love to make, you know, I'd love to make more films in Australia. I would love to make films in different parts of the world. But there's a particular kind of Hollywood door that has opened and, and, and opened in a way that I had hoped it might, but I never anticipated that it would open as wide as it has. Mm. And, um, and so, you know, whatever, you know, in terms of my thinking about what I do next, I have to think quite clearly about making sure that I take advantage of how incredible this opportunity that's been presented to me is. Mm. Du kan snart finde vores anmeldelse af Animal Kingdom på hjemmesiden, og på fredag kan du også se den i ugens anden films tv-udsendelse. I næste uge går films tv i krig med vampyrgenren i forbindelse med premieren på Let Me In. På gensyn. Husk selvfølgelig, at du kan læse endnu flere artikler og anmeldelser på hjemmesiden, som du også kan diskutere i vores omfattende online forum.